Hello. Welcome to Nothing But Net, our program that explores the global internet. My name is Rich Wiggins, and as always, I'd like to introduce my partner in crime, Chuck Severance. Thanks, Rich. It's sort of a tradition that we start out the show and share with each other all the crazy things that are internet related that we've come across in the last uh, few weeks or so. So I see you've got a whole pile of stuff. So what'd you bring for show and tell? Well, the first item, Chuck, um, I've somehow gotten on the mailing list of an internet website okay. that wants to brag about what they're doing every a month. A mailing list of an internet website. Yeah, a paper mailing list. A paper mailing, okay. For a website. And so I think it's because I used to write for Internet World magazine, at least the mailing label would imply that. But every month I get a thing bragging about what's on www.garden.com. And I guess that's, that's, at first I thought, sort of a goofy thing to do. But then if you think about the motivation of a website, they're almost like a television program. They want to build as much traffic as they can for their site. You don't realize this, but you predicted this about two years ago. I don't remember that. Did I do that? You predicted that they would stop sending you catalogs and send you reminders. Yes. You did predict that. Yes, and if, if they're primarily a catalog type site, if you're L.L. Bean, I think L.L. Bean should send out well, eight-page catalogs instead of 80-page catalogs. Right, but I think that's exactly what this is. I mean, what, what is well, it looks like it's gifts, right? Yeah, I guess it is. We could look at the website a little bit here. Yeah. And as you can see, the uh, what's on the website is... Stocking stuffers. Happen to be taping this episode in, in holiday season. last-minute Christmas shopping. So, so they have done exactly what you predicted, and you didn't even notice it. You know, it'd be great if I'd take some of the ideas I've got and implement them instead of just predicting them. Yeah, so what else have you got? Never made a nickel off the Internet, you know? It's... No, you made a nickel or two. All right, I made a nickel off the Internet. So what else have you got? One other item um, in terms of folks bragging about their URLs, I was down in Alabama recently. My dad was in the hospital, and I spent some time in Huntsville where he was uh -huh. in the hospital. And I kept finding all of these um, billboards around town that were sort of a discussion going on. Robert talking to Angie and all One this One of these stuff. commercials where there's a, th a thread or a there plot. There was a thread, a plot. And the only common element was a URL, www.thepaddockclub.com. Dot com, and it turned out www.thepaddockclub.com in fact refers to an apartment complex. Oh. And so this is supposed to be like, you know, Melrose Place or something. These people are all oh. going off, uh, you know, uh, to, to this one wonderful apartment complex and interacting and everything. That's interesting because you, I, I, you're always intrigued by these little kind of trick marketing things. But by slipping a URL in, you can always let people kind of figure out what the ending is. But what's interesting is they don't give you any clue what they are at all in the billboard. You right. don't know that it's an apartment or That's anything so else. That's so that you'll go there. It's indirect marketing. Yeah. What else you got? Okay, now you've been a big fan of the idea of grocery stores getting up on the web. Yes, I have. I thought that was a goofy idea, and then about a month after you first said it, netgrocer.com appeared. So I said, well, it's a goofy idea. But Chuck and I didn't make a nickel off of that Chuck either. Chuck predicted it, didn't make a nickel off of it. Right. So Meyer, the big chain in the Midwest, has a website, as you've pointed out. Right. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? HTTP. Oh, gee whiz. We got slashes. We got forward slashes and we got backslashes. An MS-DOS person typed that so in. in. Well, yeah, but they put it up on a big sign and they got it wrong. <laughs> so you can't even type that in. I mean, that's not a valid URL. You I don't know what that. a browser would do if you type that in. I but, wonder if but, Netscape, uh, Netscape might fail. And but my, my advice to Meyer is don't fix the slashes. Take HTTP colon slash slash off of oh, the site. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because all browsers will now let you just type www.meyer.com and you're in. So why yep. put that other stuff up there? It's pretty slick. So you got to bring anything else with you? No, that's all my props. Okay, well, we might as well get on with the rest of the show. think about it, it turns out your garden variety web browser isn't really all that smart. There's only a few file types it knows how to handle. And there's a panoply of multimedia types that you need to handle. Chuck, how do we deal with it? Well, Rich, I would say that the most commonly asked question that people get when they first get Netscape going is plugins. Because you got everything working, you got your ISP, and all of a sudden you go click on something and it pops up and says, well, I don't know how to handle this media. So common, a very commonly asked question is plugin. And as you said, some forms of media are just not built into your browser. 
the common ones like GIF for pictures and HTML for text and JPEG for pictures are there. And it's nice, you just click and it shows up and you really don't know, you don't even notice really how it all works. But others require a plugin or a helper application. So what we're going to do is go through the steps required to extend your browser by downloading the in installation package. Then you exit Netscape or Explorer, install the application, and then you restart Netscape. So before we go on to how to do this, let's review some of the common types of media. Common one is Real Player, which plays streaming media, streaming audio, and streaming video, and streaming animation. And you download that from www.real.com. Another one is Shockwave, and you download that from www.macromedia.com. Adobe PDF, or PostScript Display Format Viewer, is very useful if you're going to be seeing papers or, or technical documentation from vendors www.adobe.com and another thing you'll need is a PostScript viewer a program called Ghost View or a program called ROPS are common tools to view PostScript if you're looking for a plugin go to www.windows95.com or www.tucos.com now often the question is do you have to pay for plugins and the answer is generally not they're either shareware in which case you do have to pay for them after you've used them long enough but a lot of companies will give them away free and that's because they want to promote their particular form of media. So it depends on each one, but many of the common ones are absolutely free and you have, no, you have no responsibility to register them or pay for them. And other less common ones will often be shareware. So, take a couple of steps. To install the real player, we'd go to www.real.com slash products slash player slash index.html. And like many, you have to fill out some forms. You have to give your name and your email address and check a box as to whether or not you want to receive regular email. Now, for a while, I didn't check these boxes, but I have been lately checking the boxes, and my email isn't filling up. It's, it's the, I don't get a ton of junk mail, so it's kind of, it's kind of a, a courteous thing for you to do to say, yes, it's okay to send me mail. I mean, they're giving you a piece of software for absolutely nothing. Maybe they can send you a little bit of mail. The download should take 10 to 30 minutes on a modem. It might take a little more, it might take a little less. If you have a cable modem, if you're so lucky, that would take far less than that. It may take a minute or a minute and a half. When, before you start the download, you have to tell it where you're going to save it. Now, the download is essentially like a purchase of software. It's as if you went to Best Buy or another and you picked up a floppy disk or a CD-ROM. The download is pulling material onto your computer. So you've got to keep track of where this is at because you're going to need this later in the installation. I've created a directory on my, all my computers, c, back, c colon backslash temp for my downloads. So you must remember where you put it, and you also want to remember where it is. Now, you, you have to use the little navigation button right up here if, if you're going to move up or down the directory hierarchy, and here it will tell you the name of the file. Once its download has been completed, you get out of your browsers. You must do this because part of the installation is going to modify your browser configuration. So you go to your computer icon and go to C colon and then navigate on your way down. And of course, if you remember to put it in temp, it's quite easy. Then you find the file that you just downloaded and you highlight it and you double click on it. You follow the instructions and it'll ask you some questions and it may ask you to register the product and type in your email again. Generally, just say yes and next and say yeah, yeah, yeah and let it install where it wants to on your hard disk. And uh, then it will finish. And then the next thing you do, if the installation all goes well, is you restart Netscape or Internet Explorer and you go back to the page and you should be able to view the media. So, that in a nutshell is how you install and use plugins. Got anything to add, Rich? Chuck, I think that was a great overview. Um, one option that people have if they go to the Netscape site is you can go and get a whole kit and caboodle of plugins all at once in a package that's something like 16 megabytes in size. Right. And that's a time when you're really going to wish that you had a cable modem because if you don't, it's going to be a few hours to download it. I have and, to agree. And with a cable modem, it'll be a few minutes. So when we come back, we'll be going on the road. Now, for the first time on the show, we're going to go on the road virtually. So, Rich, show us what you've got. Well, Chuck, several months ago, I was lucky enough at Internet World to run into this fellow named Ken Spector. And Ken is a fellow who works for an organization called Hollywood Online. Pretty neat. Hollywood Online 
had this idea of let's go and do all of the kinds of interviews that they do on Entertainment Tonight and similar right. shows, but let's do them ourselves and put them up on the Internet. And Ken is the guy that gets to go around and interview all these different folks. And that's kind of a difficult and arduous job. So let's see what Poor he has guy, to say. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's see what he has okay. to say. Hey, Ken, how you doing? Hey, Rich, how are you? Doing just well. Yeah. Are we doing, are we working now? Are we going? Yeah. Ken, we're doing so good. Um, okay. Listen, I hear that you're interviewing mm -hmm. some special folks tonight. Who? The special folks tonight, yes, I am. I'm actually interviewing the cast and producers and other miscellaneous celebrities for the film Tomorrow Never Dies, which is the upcoming James Bond film. Wow, that's pretty exciting. Now, your name is Spectre. What are you going to say to Pierce Brosnan? I'm going to ask Pierce Brosnan whether he is aware that there was an organization, an mm -hmm. evil organization in one of the James Bond films called Spectre. I'm not sure if I'm going to ask him that, but you never know. Do you ever pal around with these people? Uh, I know other celebrities. Um, I actually work out at the same gym that Sinbad works out at, and I actually interviewed him two weeks ago. Uh, um, a few uh, here and there. Yeah, I guess you. And how many of these wonderful celebrities have you interviewed over the course of your career now? Over the course of my career, I'm going to have to say upwards of 400. 400. Do you put every name on your resume? Not, no, I just put uh, the, the A-list, as they call them in Hollywood, some of the more the, the higher paid and, and more uh, famous actors. Uh, and the, the actors that aren't quite as famous tend to drop off my resume list. So tell us a few of the A-list people that you've interviewed. A-list people? No. Uh, Robin Williams, Danny DeVito, um, let's see here, Sigourney Weaver, uh, Demi Moore, Bruce Willis. Uh, it goes on and on. Was Bruce Willis nearby when you interviewed Demi Moore? Uh, yes, yeah, sitting right next to her. So you couldn't like ask her out on a date or anything, because Bruce? No, I was I was thinking about it, but uh, I figured that Bruce would knock me out if I were to ask her out on a date, so I decided against that. Now, tell me a little bit about how Hollywood Online uses your interviews. Okay. Uh, basically, what Hollywood Online does is they go out, uh, some, the creative affairs director goes out at Hollywood Online, finds a sponsor, such as Intel or IBM, uh, a lot of computer companies want to sponsor areas on a website, uh, and these areas basically highlight a various movie, a various, uh, uh, movie, and what I do is I interview celebrities, uh, those clips of the interviews are stored and archived as QuickTime movies, AVI files, or streamed through the internet using NetShow, um, which is a streaming plugin. Do you have any idea what your audience is like? Uh, I personally don't, but I do know that yesterday Hollywood Online received a wonderful letter from Intel claiming this is the most successful promotion that they have had on the internet for their Pentium 2 product. And uh, I don't actually see all of the statistics, but Hollywood Online says hundreds of thousands of people uh, download the QuickTime clips, and there are uh, loads of viewers of the, the uh, Extreme or the Net Show uh, movies as well, or the streaming video. Wow. Sometimes when you um, find yourselves doing some of these interviews, are you ever in a situation where a celebrity appears and you don't know that you're going to interview that person and now you've got to really hustle and come up with the right question? You know, that happens all the time. Uh, either I know this, but I don't know the face, or I don't know the face, and I don't know whether that person is or is not an actor. And actually, um, what I normally do in a situation like that is I'll ask the person what their current projects are. And based on the information that they give me, I'm able to determine whether they are an actor, producer, writer. Uh, it, it can be very difficult. It, 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 I, I can't say humiliating because I haven't embarrassed myself yet, but uh, I imagine it could be. Well, have any of these celebrities been mean to you? Uh, mean. I can't say any of them have been outright mean, but I will have to say that there are some celebrities which I would much rather or much prefer to interview than others. Um, some are just rather difficult in the sense of when you're talking to them, they don't speak, they don't say, say anything, 
don't talk about what they're doing, and they're, they don't seem that interested. Others seem overly interested in what they're doing, and, and they're, they tend to be much easier to speak with and much easier to interview as well. Well, Ken, we're hoping that you're going to be willing to come back on future episodes of our show and tell us some anecdotes about some of these uh, celebrities. I would absolutely love to. I would absolutely love to. In fact, as I said, I'm going tonight to be interviewing the uh, celebrities on the film for the film Small the Dies, and, you know, maybe next time we can talk, talk about some anecdotes. Excellent. Thanks so much, Ken. So thank you so Bye. much, Rich. Take care. Bye. Well, Rich, that was uh, pretty interesting. We probably ought to talk a little bit about the technology that we used on that. Uh, go ahead. Well, um, we used Microsoft NetMeeting, right. and we used a little Connectix QuickCam right. to send video to him, and he used a similar color QuickCam to send video to us, and the audio and video were transmitted completely and purely over the Internet. Now, we're receiving at cable modem speeds here in the studio, right. but he's using a dial-up 56K modem, and in fact, he's very jealous, he says, that here in Michigan we've got cable modems and he doesn't. Right, and, and if both of us had cable modems, it certainly would have been a far better quality than, that, than what we saw. That's absolutely so. right. On Tech Talk, Rich is going to tell us about copy protection technologies available on the Internet. That's right, Chuck. A lot of information providers on the Internet these days are worried. They want to be able to put up high-quality content, but then they don't want other people to be able to take that content and incorporate it into their websites or repurpose it in other ways. But there's some nifty technologies that are coming along that will help information providers protect their own content. Copyright is really something of a balancing act. We're trying to balance the interests of creators and publishers of content versus consumers of content. So we want everyone who wants to provide rich, original, and creative kinds of information on the Internet or in other realms to be able to do so. And we want consumers to be able to get hold of content at reasonable prices. But both interests need to be balanced. On the web, we have some really special issues that come up in terms of copyright. One thing that's broadly misunderstood, a lot of folks think it's perfectly all right to go to a website and grab an image off of it and plop it down in your own website. Generally, that is agreed to be a violation of the copyright of the content provider. So you can't take an image or an audio or, or video clip and repurpose it on your own site. In fact, though, the Internet and the web present some really interesting new kinds of cases because of the very nature of hypertext and hyperlinking, and those issues will probably only be resolved by litigation or legislation. One example case is the Microsoft Seattle Sidewalk site. Now, Microsoft has all kinds of interesting event information in the Seattle area. And if you want to buy a ticket to one of these events, they offer a hyperlink off to Ticketmaster. Now, you follow one of those links and you buy a ticket for the event. It turns out Ticketmaster objects to this because they feel that they have a right to enforce people coming in on their own home page. If you don't come in through the home page, then you don't see all the ads that Ticketmaster has put up on their site. So, a lawsuit is underway, and if Ticketmaster prevails, there's going to be some interesting implications. It's even possible to violate copyright without, without ever doing a physical copy operation yourself. Let's suppose that an interloper wants to put up some content in the form of a picture of Mickey Mouse. And so, due to the way in HTML we refer to an inline image, we can reference an image that resides on another server, www.disney.com, and the viewer, the reader of the page, will see the image right there on the page. But ripoff.com never physically stored the page on their server. Interesting cases will come up, I'm sure. Total News is another interesting and new example. These folks went off and said, let's build one little index to all the popular new um, news sources out there on the net. But they used frames. And so if you were to click, for instance, on CNN Interactive, the Total News implementation would give you a window within a window where you would see the content. And the major media players were very upset by this. Total News, since I captured this example, has revised their method of presentation. And in fact, when you click on CNN, it comes up in a different window. So all these technologies have come along to try to help content providers prevent and detect violations of copyright. Let's look at a few examples. 
Degraded content is a simple example. If you have some images that you're selling, you can put up for free low-resolution samples of those images, and then you don't have a problem with anyone stealing it because the quality of the image that you've presented is so low that nobody would find any value in it. Digital watermarking technology is another very interesting scheme. This is a tracking mechanism whereby a visible seal of some sort, perhaps a trademark or other seal, is applied to an image. And due to the way this is incorporated into the image, it would be very hard to use a digital image editor and remove it. Here's an example of a digital watermark. This is from a Vatican collection, and you can see the watermark, but it doesn't intrude upon reading the words in Latin on the image. This gives the Vatican confidence that scholars around the world can, in fact, consume this content, but a publisher of a coffee table book couldn't go and repurpose it. Invisible watermarks are another scheme where you can put trademarks or seals within a content of a, of a page, but those will not be visible to viewers. However, you can sort of put a virtual infrared light over the content, and now the watermark becomes visible. Digimark is a company that's got Mark Spider technology, and one of the first consumers of that technology is Playboy Enterprises. Whenever they put content up on their website, they mark it with Mark Spider, and if someone goes and repurposes the content, they can go and find them and send them a letter saying, cease and desist. Audio watermarks are analogous. Liquid Audio is a pioneer of this technology. What we have here is you put within the audio, within the bitstream of a compact disc, watermarking information. And the company N2K will now allow you to download a record over the internet in its entirety, make your own CD using CDR technology, but they're going to put a watermark in there. And if you set up your own mill in your basement and recopy over and over again that content, they will track you down and you will get a very nasty letter and you may go to prison. Secure containers are sort of a final concept and the idea here is we go and we wrap content in some sort of a secure encrypted fashion. Now the content then can flow freely anywhere you want it to and folks around the net can go and look at it but in order to actually interpret it in a visible way to read it on screen a transaction takes place between your browser going back to a server somewhere to say, okay, Chuck is reading this content right now, or we're going to give him permission to read it. And only if Chuck has subscribed to the content or paid for the content will the container be opened. So the secure container is really a very liberating concept because I can write the next American novel, send it all around the planet on CD-ROMs and on websites everywhere, but I have a high degree of confidence that nobody will read the content other than those folks that I've authorized. I think that's all very amazing technology and sort of at its, at its peak, then you don't even care who has it anymore. And that's the thing that I find most fascinating. It's going to be interesting to see how this stuff gets deployed. Yep. Coming up, the news of the net. Now let's see what's happening in the news of the net. First off, we may finally have a standard for 56 kilobit per second modems. The original vendors of these modems built devices that couldn't interoperate. 3Com slash US Robotics had one standard, and Rockwell had a different standard. The ITU is working on a compromise between these two incompatible standards. Probably you'll be able to upgrade your modem via software. However, your dial-up modem still will be at best one-fiftieth of the speed of a cable modem. Virtual universities are coming on stream. By 1998, a number of universities will offer classes via the Internet. This includes individual universities as well as those belonging to regional consortia. One such consortium is the Western Governors Association. They'll be offering general associates degree as well as an associates in semiconductor manufacturing. The Southern Regional Education Board says that 1,500 courses available for credit will be taught by 50 different Southern universities. And the Michigan Virtual Auto College offers about 200 different classes from a dozen different universities. Some internet magazines have died. Meckler Media has announced some changes in its lineup. Internet World, a monthly mass market publication, will cease publication. Web Week, a trade publication, 
will be renamed Internet World, and it will become a controlled circulation magazine. Another mass market Internet related publication, NetGuide, died several months ago. The Gartner Group is questioning whether network computers are ready for prime time. Large scale deployment of network computers simply hasn't happened. Companies seem to be worried about the cost of upgrading their network and various administration and support issues. One Gartner Group analyst said, who cares if the computer is cheap if the network is expensive? A judge has ruled against Microsoft. The Justice Department had sued claiming monopolistic practices, claiming that Microsoft forced PC vendors to incorporate the Internet Explorer on all systems sold. Microsoft has countered that Internet Explorer is part of the Windows 95 operating system. However, a judge didn't accept this argument. He said that the Internet Explorer is an application just like Word or Excel. Microsoft is appealing. Chuck, what do you think of this? Uh, I don't know. I, I think that judge is kind of lost. I think it's, it's a bit too late. It, this is sort of like the tempest in a teapot about Microsoft Networks when Windows 95 first came out. Microsoft Network failed of its own accord. <laughs> and whether it came on the CD-ROM with Windows 95, everyone was so scared of that. America Online is stronger than ever. And so it's like if, if this is a good product, why not have it on the CD-ROM? If it's a lousy product, who cares if it's on the CD-ROM? The product ought to stand on its own merit. Well, I think one of the claims was that Microsoft was forcing Internet Explorer to the exclusion of Netscape Navigator. Some vendors had a deal that we'll put Net Netscape Navigator as the default browser, and they felt like they were being strong-armed into making IE of the default browser. Um, I think you raise a valid point. When Windows 98 comes out, the browser will look like part of the desktop. The web will look like part of the desktop. And I hate to say it, but I think it would be sort of crippling progress if we didn't allow the operating system to evolve in that way. I, I, I have to agree with you completely. I'm tired of the browser being a separate application with all the plugins and the gadgets. Just make the darn thing work. If it's 50% of what we do with our computers, just make it work. And you know what? The truth of the matter, this goes back to your talk earlier in today's show. The browser isn't really a very fancy piece of software. No, absolutely um, not. And the file browser on our desktop isn't something that we, we hope to get a competitive version. Right. If the file browser could view HTML, it's almost, and GIF and JPEG, it's pretty much become a web browser. Exactly. It needs to open an HTTP okay. session and pull down a file. And exactly. that's, that's well, hey, we could argue about this all night long, I'm sure. We probably will. But uh, we're out of time, so. So we'll see you on the net. <laughs>